for joining us again on another episode of the Plymouth Historical Society's latest initiative. We're calling it the Memories of Plymouth. It's a collection of stories, uh, memories that people have. Some who were born here, some have worked here most of their lives, socialized, or more. Today, our guest is Evelyn McNeil. So Evelyn, thank you very much for agreeing to be taped today. I'm looking forward to it. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a series of questions that we typically ask everybody. Many people in town know you, know you knew your husband, um, and some people have heard of you, and some people may not know who you are. And therefore, we're going to ask a few typical identifying questions before we really begin. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. State your full name, please. Um, Evelyn White McNeil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? I was born in Aguirre, Puerto Rico in uh, January of 1935. 1935. Yeah. And, and may I ask, why were you born in Puerto Rico? It was the first job my father had after graduating from the Air School of Engineering at Dartmouth. He, it was the during the Depression, and there weren't a lot of local jobs. And so the Sugar Central was hiring people for maintenance, and they needed an engineer, and so we applied. Right. He went down there right after his graduation in 31 and came up in 33, married my wife and married my mother and hauled her down there. <laughs> and my brother and I were both born there. Hmm. We came back up just before the Second World War when the U-boats were doing a number on our shipping and our uh, passenger ships. What year would that be approximately? 41. 41. So your first 10 years of, uh, eight, seven years of life were down there? Yeah, S uh, six years. See, mm -hmm. we, uh, okay. the, the, it was the Algonquin Line mm -hmm. was the name of the ship, uh, the shipping company, and this was the last trip this particular one took before it was torpedoed. Wow. Well, which wow. was kind of brings you back to it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, your grandparents' name? My my father's parents were Alfred and Mamie White. They were telephone pioneers. And my uh, mother's parents were Ed and Evelyn Maynard of the DNM company. And you yeah. say pioneers of telephone. Could you explain that to the audience a little bit? They were, um, my grandfather w ran the uh, office in Plymouth. It was a Plymouth and Campton Telephone Exchange, I think the name of it was. And he and one other helper put in all the phones and all the lines that were currently being used back then. And my grandmother was a uh, operator at, the, at that time until she started having children. <laughs> right. mm. so. and, and I remember you giving to me, as part of the Historical Society, the first operating telephone book. Yes. Am I correct on yes. that? And it was handwritten. Yeah. And there were a number of lines. There would be a certain line that was dedicated to Plymouth Normal School. Yeah. Uh, a certain line dedicated to Holderness School, the school then known Holderness for Boys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah. you had a relative that worked there. Or was it she that actually? It was my grandmother who made that particular book. Her sister also worked there, uh, Josephine Sargent. She was married to Harrison Sargent over in Holderness, right across from the school, mm -hmm. across Chapel Lane, I think, the yeah. school. And uh, she also worked there. I, I didn't know her too well. I only met her a couple times. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so your education was a mixture? Yes. Location-wise. Yeah. I started in Puerto Rico, and I graduated in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, in the Chamonix High School in 52. And between them, I went to school in Wilmington, Delaware, Baltimore, and Norristown, Pennsylvania. And uh, then came back right smack up here to Plymouth Teachers College. Hmm. Hmm. Right. Well, this is interesting. So if we go back to elementary school, was English the language? 
Yes, it was. It was a community down there that was uh, uh, made up of workers and professional people from all over the place. We had people from Britain, we had people from other places in the United States like Texas, and some German couples. Wow. They were, wow. it was very interesting. My, my mother loved it down there because it was fascinating. You know? In she what liked, respect? Well, she liked the variety. Mm -hmm. I made a comment once when I moved up here to go to school and I said, Mom, this place is awful white bread. She said, you got it. That's why I love Puerto Rico. <laughs> diversified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, diversified. Mm -hmm. I, sure. Yeah, she, sure. She really liked that. Right. So you had no education here in the town of Plymouth other than going to Plymouth Teachers College. I had half a year of, first, of second grade under a woman by the name of Stella Durkee, who oh. eventually became the principal of the lab school. Oh, my. Oh my. Yeah. Hmm. So Female. Yeah. Female. At that time. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. But, well, mm -hmm. she was a, a graduate. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the people that was one of my mentors there was Marion Seavey, who had quite an interesting uh, career as in teaching obstinate young men how to read. Two of them being, uh, one of them was uh, Bill Maynard, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> another one was, I think, one of the Deachmans. So ah. <laughs> it's not that they couldn't or wouldn't, they probably would have been diagnosed with something in this day and age, but, uh, but she leaned on them and they learned. Mm. So. And relationship of Bill Maynard to you? She, he would be my uncle, my mother's youngest brother. And for those people that may not know Bill Maynard, he was a lawyer. He was, when he was in the service in the Second World War, the uh, service put him through the rest of his law school. He became a judge, advocate in the service, and he became a judge when he came out. And he worked for Nice Wander and Lord for a while, and mm -hmm. then he moved to Plymouth and had his own business. Mm -hmm. With some of the people he worked with was uh, his wife, for one thing, who was also a lawyer. Uh, Bill Batchelor, uh, uh, Ross Dietrich's brother, what was his name? John? Anyway, mm -hmm. he was one of them, and, and the first one was Anwar Samaha, mm -hmm. with, of, of your family. That's right, <laughs> yeah, right. that's right. That's and, right. Uh, let's see, the last people he worked with, I think, I think it might have been Bill Batchelor. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, uh, and they all had that office up above York's. They just kind of all went from one to the other, you know. All right. And York's today is no longer York's. No, no. It's, uh, I don't know what it is now. It's been a hot dog place. It's been mm -hmm. uh, several things. He, uh, Bill eventually became the uh, Attorney General, General of the state of New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, he, he died uh, several years ago. His wife uh, outlasted him a long time. Leela did. And it was she, unusual, a lawyer marrying a lawyer. He told everybody he married her because when he had to write out uh, briefs and things, his uh, wife was the one who could spell. <laughs> <laughs> Good reason, huh? Yes, yeah, right. Right. and she mm -hmm. was. She was, she was mm -hmm. a very, she I think was a valedictorian of her law school class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I only met her once, I remember, at one of our open yes. houses that we had with all the kids there, the children. Yeah, that was yeah. nice. Since you brought up Plymouth Teachers College, could we spend a few minutes talking Certainly. about your experiences when you were there? And this was Teachers College, what, four years maybe, were you there? I was there from 52 to 54, okay. and then I left for seven years after I married Alan and came back seven years later and finished. I had to make up some time, so I had a year and a half, and mm -hmm. I graduated in uh, uh, 60, 64. Wow, yeah. so the beginning of the 50s and the beginning Big of change, the 60s. Just, in that, just in that seven years, a big and, change. What kind of a change? Well, I noticed that there were more remedial subjects being taught. In fact, they made me take a remedial math course, which I wasn't too 
keen about taking, but I think I think they were just kind of uh, hedging their bets on newer students or people mm -hmm. coming in. in mm -hmm. So, and I I was never a math major. I was an elementary school major, but not. And I taught math, but uh, and I had to do that. And I noticed that uh, there was a lot of remedial English in classes. And I was surprised because I didn't remember them being there when I came up in '52. But what was the population like in that span of ten years? Did you see a lot of growth difference? Oh yes, a lot of growth. Diff different mm -hmm. de departments are bigger and more diversified. And when I went in '52, you almost could know everybody on campus. Mm -hmm. And it would be ridiculous to say you could now, but even in uh, the 60s, it was it had started to grow mm -hmm. under uh, Dr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, he came about the same time I did. You're yeah. right, early a lot part of, of it. Did. That's yeah. right, 51, 52. But there were there were a lot of good professors here early on that I remember. Really, a lot of them: uh, uh, Charles Kinney, and uh, let's see who else. Um, of course, uh, Carl Grerup and Elwood Hayslip in the art department, department. and uh, they were just so. Marion C.V. was one, uh, Mac Bounds in the lab school, and uh, Leona Drew, hmm. who had drew the short straw when she had my son in the class, but she <laughs> did well by him. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd get a kick out of that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> they were they just. It was a warm environment, I think. Uh, the hardest thing for me was when I did start teaching, when they, the, the town took over the teaching. And it was kind of a flap at the time that uh, three people were supposed to be leaving. They had even hired a, a separate uh, superintendent, a guy by the name of Ken Smith, to do the dirty work hmm. instead of letting hmm. making Mr. Bowie do it, Wayne Bowie, and uh, two of us did not have uh, continuing contract. It's called then, not uh, uh, tenure. So we did not really have any recourse. But one of them, Ida Kelly, did, and she fought it and stayed. Hmm. So, hmm. so I, I thought that was. Uh, I think it was an upheaval, but I don't know how much of it was something that was bound to happen or whether it was the kind of thing new broom sweeps clean, hmm. which hmm. I saw in the service all the time when I, hmm. my husband was in the service. New, new commanders always have to make a big flap about putting their rules in order so that people will know that things are being changed. Hmm. <laughs> Your name, it was uh, Charles Keeney? Kenny. Kenny. No, no, yeah. Kinney, K-I-N-N-Y. There was a ha Harry Kenny here too, who taught Harry science. Kenny. Charles was the uh, the guy that started the uh, uh, model UN. Absolutely. Yeah. Simulations. I remember That's working right. under him in one one year, and uh, his, and I had a roommate uh, from India, uh, Dalet Pastanji. She married a, a guy by the name I think o o Omara and lived. She's not with us anymore, but she lived in Laconia. Hmm. And uh, she was very interesting, and she always was, uh, they, they always had to have her in the pictures when they were doing that because of her sari she would wear. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. So there Mr. Was, Kinney started the simulations, UN stimulations. James Hogan continued, continued them afterwards. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, he was uh, both very, very interesting people. So yeah. your major would have been in education. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had a uh, history and English minor, both wow. of them. Wow. And I did, I, ha I probably could have had an art minor too because I was taking extra classes, at least when I first started. It's my aunt would say, you burn the candle at both ends. Mm. It's quite a flame, but uh, it dies out pretty quick. <laughs> I'm thinking about student teaching and how that has changed over the years uh, from the normal school. And when you student taught your capstone experience, was that within Plymouth at these schools or yeah. did they move you away? I went to, I student taught in the fifth grade under Leona Drew. 
Okay. And they had just started moving the classes from for different subjects. Okay. So and and uh, so I was working with. Uh, let me see. Um, Joyce Mayhew, um, Pauline Spitzner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she's a gem. There's mm -hmm. nobody ever going to be like her. Mm -hmm. and, My hand goes up. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, Marion, what was her name? Bent? Uh, no, no. Marion, um, she's got sons that live right here in town, uh, okay. live in Camden. Twin sons she had. Mm. Might come later. Yeah. Might come later. Two o'clock in the morning. But anyway. <laughs> we'll call you back. We'll call you back. Absolutely. That, yes. They yeah. and they were a good group to teach with, and we had to mm -hmm. learn about uh, you know synchronizing everything we did. Mm -hmm. And I was still. Uh, it was rather interesting. So and I thought I thought my uh, practice teaching. That's what my grandmother called it because she went to school here too, and she she said she I thought mine was. Very, very good. I thought I was exposed to almost anything that could possibly happen. That, you know, that uh, some of it was a lot of cleaning up, but not, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed my whole college experience. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Was there a memory that sticks out from your separated years at Plymouth? Well, when I was first in, I was in the Plymouth Players and in the choir. Mm. And uh, I was in a couple of productions. I was not exactly the, uh, a shooting star, shall we say, but I love the stagecraft part. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and we did do a combined uh, art, dra drama and musical thing uh, down in the valley by Kurt Weill. We did that, and I was the female that was supposed to be springing all over the stage, which they didn't do well, but mm. we, we got good reviews from the local press. <laughs> so who would have been the director of the theater program at that time? Roy White. Roy White. Roy White. Mm -hmm. I really respected him. And he was, he was so easy to work with. He demanded a lot. He did. But it, the way he was, you would automatically step up and do what he wanted. He, it was... Uh, I don't know. It's, it was something about him, an aura or something that uh, made you re I made you respect his craft and figure. Well, he knew what he was doing, so I'll mm. do what he tell, tells me. Uh, in the latest Plymouth magazine that, that was sent to us, there were a few comments by people that worked underneath him, students, yeah. Yeah. and they appreciated what he brought. Yeah. So many of the people that he taught w went into. Uh, Careers involving the arts. I remember when I was when I went back to school. I wasn't in it anymore, but there was uh, brothers uh, James and Angus Locke that were in a whole bunch of stuff. You know, mm. Shakespearean and the stuff. And I read up about them, and I got the first uh, directory of graduates that mm -hmm. they put out in. Uh, I forget when it, it was quite a while ago. It put out because they've had one since at least one. And they were both in uh, creative arts, uh, either uh, in uh, a couple of the southern cities where mm -hmm. they would run museums or uh, dr drama groups and things like that. That's yeah. that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear. Yes. So he certainly knew how to inspire yes, people, and he knew his craft. Yep, mm -hmm. he certainly did. No, that sounds great. Let, let's chat a little bit, if we can, um, just. Let's take us back a little bit. Your reflections on living in Plymouth over the years. Yes, you may not have lived here during your first decade of your life, but what has it been like over the last five or six decades here? Well, Plymouth has always been like home base because my parents were both raised here and went to school here, and our grandparents were here. So even when we came up from the Middle Atlantic states to visit, we we knew the town. We'd come in, we'd stay at the camp on Squam Lake, and we'd come over and do our shopping, or go to church, or go to the. Li we went to the Holderness Library too, but we also had cards at the Plymouth, Little Plymouth Library. That was the first thing I got from my son when we moved up here in '62 was a library card. <laughs> I figured he'd really get a kick out of the library, and he did. 
And the library then was located where? It, in the Historical Society business the, uh, building, mm -hmm. the uh, old Daniel Webster courthouse right, behind right. the existing town hall. Does your son still have his library card? I doubt that. <laughs> I always I, I was all I could do to get the books back there, but you know, right. <laughs> That's neat. That's neat. What changes have you seen possibly over the decades in Plymouth? You call it a home base. That's Yes, neat. it was. I I would never leave Plymouth simply because it feels like it's always felt like home. Because we were kind of peripatetic moving and to, yeah. from place to place when we were younger and getting used to new people and breaking into new classes and I actually survived better than my brother did but uh, he made it out all right. He, he went to Holderness School for Boys when we moved up here and uh, I just uh, there's something about the people. One of the first people I met when we got here was Dean Hodges, mm. Congregational Minister, they were running a uh, day, daily uh, vacation Bible school over in Holderness. And we got snapped up practically out of the car, my brother and I, to go help with it. I think my mother had something to do with that to keep us out of her hair and while they were unpacking and stuff. So I did the craft stuff and my brother did water stuff swimming and paddling and all that sort of is. Keeping up, counting heads is what you're doing hmm. in the water. And, uh, so the craft stuff stays with you over your lifetime as you're going to be sharing with us later. Yes, it hmm. has. It, nice. uh, my dad was very clever with his hands, as you can see with this, but he uh, built all of our, he built a, a lot of our furniture in our home in, in Puerto Rico. He built all of our baby furniture because of bugs our cribs were greens, top and mm -hmm. sides, mm -hmm. and um, he uh, made us a, a double desk we had out on the porch, with, mm -hmm. opened up with a chair on either end, and once they both opened up, and we could hide stuff in it, and, cool. and he built a big uh, um, swing set for us. Out. That swing set was so big it looked like one that belonged in a, uh, by a city school or something. It was so huge. <laughs> he had some of the guys that worked for him uh, come up and help him put it together. You know. What was the age difference between you and your brother? I can see you right. Eighteen months. Eighteen months. Yeah. All right. I can see you at the two desks. Yeah. We can. <laughs> fighting. Good. My mother, mm. people would ask my mother, oh they're so close together. Do they work? Do they do things together? My mother says they do everything together, especially fight. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, that's a good th one. <laughs> that closeness is what brings that on, you know. That's but. neat. I'm going to talk about um, childhood memories now, if I can, and how they've affected you. And I'm w again, we're talking about your teen years and moving yeah. forward a little bit. We talked about the major um, changes in the town that you have seen during your tenure here, but were there weather issues? Were there fires during your tenure? People that have come before you during the interview process, yeah. they have talked about certain fires. Not that we've had many, we've had one yeah. or two that we can still talk about, remember. Uh, fairs that you may have gone to, celebrations that you may have gone to. Oh yes, celebrations that 200th anniversary or the parade and everything. Mm -hmm. My mother was involved with that and she grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and had me help. And uh, I already had a lot on my plate, but I never said no to my mom. So. We don't do that. <laughs> no, no, we don't. And uh, so that was I 1963. Remember, I, I remember the uh, when I was a freshman, I remember the uh, flood, I think it was in spring of 53. You couldn't get out of here unless you went on the railroad tracks north. We had to, uh, and a whole gang of freshman girls bunched up together and we walked to the edge of the road where the water started all around the town. So, Because we, we didn't wow. think they were telling us the truth. <laughs> of course we can get out. You know. mm -hmm. And we get up to a place and we see the water, you know. And oh. Wow. <laughs> How far yeah. north would you have walked? Um, north, we uh, walked up to where the, the steel bridge was 
and that was uh, there was water there. In fact, I think Rand's gas tanks were floating around. Oh yes, on the left. I think they mm -hmm. tied them down since then. Wow. But, wow. And then uh, we went up to uh, towards where Hatch Plaza is now, and it wasn't there. And I, we could see that Clark's fields were, were very much uh, flooded. But there's a low spot before you get up there, and I think there's a brook or something there, and that was, hmm. I don't know how deep it was. So it was Clark's sort of Field is where Harris Brothers is yes, today? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. That's where that is. Okay. And south, of course, right about where Louis Sleeper's gas station was on right. uh, the road south toward Ashland. That was, and then of course, um, just on the other side of the bridge on the Intervale, mm. to hold it us. Right, and absolutely, right. absolutely. So it was. This is 1953, I think 1953. it was. 1953. Because I started mm. in 52, and I'm assuming this was a spring mm. flood. That's interesting. I t my, my roommate didn't go with us. She was a funny girl. I still keep in touch with her because we went through a lot of stuff together anyway. Uh, I said, we're flooded, we're flooded. She gets up out of bed and goes over to the window and looks out, we're at Mary Lyon. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, we're not. Went back to bed. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if we were flooded there, mm -hmm. everybody was in trouble. <laughs> uh, it hasn't happened yet, and hopefully no. it never will. No. Um, fairs, did you ever attend the Plymouth Fair? Yes, I did. One of the mm -hmm. first things Alan took me to the summer we were going together was to the Plymouth Fair, and showing me everything. And we went up there because when he was uh, the head of the civil defense and he had auxiliary cops under him, they would go up and do the security at the fairs while he was in charge. And uh, he would tell us what days were the best days to go up. So we we for the up. events we, huh? for the events yeah for the events mm -hmm. or uh, you know what it was interesting coming and what he saw that we that that's Mike might enjoy. Oh, that's neat. And we took relatives that came to town, that that they came to town mm. for the fair. Alan's oldest brother uh, had retired from the army and he brought his wife and three kids over because he remembered going to the fair when he was a kid and he wanted his family to at least see it. You know? mm -hmm. So it was, it was an event mm. and we figured it rained at least one day, sometimes all the time. Wow. But, uh, wow. What was your favorite event at the fair that you can recall? Well, actually, too, I, I loved to go prowling around the animals, as my son did. He wanted to do the midway, okay? And mm -hmm. I liked to go where the, uh, you know, the quilting and the food and everything mm -hmm. was, and to meet all the people yep. that I... Yeah, yep. Alan's aunt was the, I guess, the last secretary treasurer of the fair. Her name was uh, Gwen Smith. She was married to Woodrow Smith. Smith. And uh, they... Uh, that was my mother-in-law's half brother. Hmm. Anyway, they she would let us know what was interesting and what people had brought some really cool stuff in and things <laughs> like that. Yeah. You you speak about your husband. Could you share with the audience a little bit more about Alan? What he did as a business, perhaps? Uh, how he worked with people throughout the town? Well, he was a. Uh, he, Right after we he moved, he came up in '63. We my son and I came up in '62, and uh, he had to finish out his uh, his uh, uh, term in the Air Force, and that wasn't over until the next summer. But he wanted me to get back to finish my school. Okay. He'd promised my mother that, <laughs> nice. and uh, so we came up and. He came up, and the first thing he did, the first job he had, was w working at the gas station, um, Esso Station on Main Street. And while he was working over there, there was a gentleman by the name of Raymond Welch who had just been appointed chief of police, mm. and came over and asked Alan if he would serve with him to help him get the police force up and going. And at that time, there were only two policemen. Mm -hmm. Alan and, uh, for heaven's sakes, uh, I hate it when I forget names. Well, what anyway. you think, but Ray Welch just passed away I at the age of 97 years old, a good mentor then. Yes, mm. he was. Mm. I, I consider he and, and his wife, his second wife, B, as, as mentors to both of us. 
we did so many things together. We went fishing together. We went up north. They used to go spend a lot of time up in Arrow and, uh, and on the uh, Lake Abegog. And we go fishing, and we fish the streams, and we had gone hunting together. To me, hunting was just a nice walk in the woods, but I <laughs> did what I was supposed to do. <laughs> anyway, um, we, and, and, and I have no biases against it, because I know there, there is a culture of it. And there are some people that overdo it, but that happens with everything people like. So we, uh, and they, uh, after he got through with Ray, he, he started the uh, civil defense. He was the civ uh, head of the civil defense in town, and he had an auxiliary police of about 20 men that they, for emergencies. They'd go, they'd go around during flood season and find out what roads had to be closed. They'd go over, they, they uh, wake up the Teak fraternity guys and make them, help them get people out of the houses on the Intervale, the commandeer boats, and mm. go over and get them. And uh, after that, he went into the insurance business, and he was in the insurance business for well over 25 years. And, uh, he did well by that. He was he was the uh, he was the kind of person who uh, he was not working for the company so much as his his clients, because he felt that insurance. Towards the end of his tenure working as an insurance person, he found there wasn't that much fun anymore because it was the bottom line was more important all of a sudden. Yeah. He managed air insurance before it was sold mm. from air, and he worked for a while after that for uh, um, noise, and uh, he had his own business twice. So he had, and he and he kept up with it. He he went to all of the classes and all the changes and stuff like that. There, he can be pretty ornery when people are trying to push people into things they didn't really need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then he did a lot of volunteer stuff. He started the fishing derby. I was the chief weigh, weigher and measurer of the trout. <laughs> I was the, oh, well, I guess you would say my classification was, I was the uh, statist statistician, mm. chief. <laughs> that sounded good, but, <laughs> but you got messy. Anyway, and he started, uh, he started the uh, Pemmy Baker Solid Waste. Mm -hmm. He was in Rotary for 31 years. Wow. He was a president uh, wow. at the 50th. And uh, he did, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to remember, he served on the uh, uh, planning board and uh, as a selectman. He went out, down and talked to a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Norman Samaha to ask him uh, what he should expect. Mm -hmm. And this certain person told him, well, if you like the idea of standing up in front of a crowd and having brick bats thrown at you, it's the perfect <laughs> job. <laughs> uh -huh. So he really contributed. He's part of what we would call our community. Yes, he yes. loved his he loved yeah. his town. People would squawk about the schools and how so much money it costs to educate the kids. And he would say, they educated eight kids in my family. I think maybe it won't hurt me to pay a tax or two. So, and that's, hmm. he was all about his town, his town, his country, hmm. his county. That's neat. So. Well, thank you for talking about him. That was fun to get to know him a little bit. That's yeah. great. He that's was a lot great. of fun too, but <laughs> we won't go to that. <laughs> Were there people throughout your lifetime, maybe people in Plymouth, but not necessarily, that meant something to you? that supported you, that mentored you? Well, when I was teaching and going through some of the flap that happened before I stopped was uh, Connie Ross. Connie Ross. And of course, B. Welch. And um, oh, there goes the name again. Um, And, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, Mac Mount. Mm. Then there was, uh, from college, and even during that time, there was Norton Bagley. 
I, I had the, the most respect for that man. Uh -huh. Anything he taught, he did well. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and locally, well, my parents and my grandparents. Mm. I could always talk to them, you know. That's and uh, it's and and Alan's parents. They they accepted me as part of the tribe. So uh, <laughs> and we were a tribe. And, and, I mean, they have some. The, the McNeils have a, a bunch of very very busy kids. They had and they worked hard. The, his second uh, sister, the second oldest sister. Married a guy by the name of Wilbur Hickson, who taught at uh, absolutely, high school. absolutely, and he is in the uh, Massachusetts Sports Hall of Fame, as well, along with his son David, who uh, is a coach at Amherst College. And there were uh, his older brother retired as a major in the army and mm. worked for an airline for years and years and years and years, and his. Uh, Oldest sister was a nurse. She was an operating supervisor at Peter Bent Brigham mm -hmm. Hospital, and she married a guy by the name of Kenneth Goldsmith, who was the head of the Department of Safety for a few years back mm -hmm. in Peterson's time. Really? I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see who else. He's youngest. He's the only two left. The older one of the older sisters, uh, Don Hickson, and his a younger sister that is. Uh, living in Raleigh, North Carolina. And, of course, his sister Priscilla Reset. Norman Reset is a very well-known contractor carpenter who does excellent work. Mm -hmm. And I keep, you keep, kept telling his wife, that's the best decision you ever made was to marry this Ooh. man. <laughs> 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 well, she agreed, but she wasn't going to tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you as you think about Plymouth and you're walking the main street, did you do you have any memories that come back of restaurants you might have visited, or or not necessarily? It could be restaurants, but foods, local foods. It could be from Mom's kitchen. Yeah. It could be from someplace else. That's one thing I didn't make bring. My mother uh, compiled a cookbook called Low Cost Meals. She had it come out uh, during one of our many uh, ten decade once a decade recessions mm -hmm. we have. And it told how to, uh, how, what things to keep on hand and what things to use that you could get from the government and mm -hmm. how to put meals together. She, she did that. She, she was a good cook. She asked uh, Diamond McKellar's wife Whoa. for a couple of recipes because uh, mom wasn't good at biscuits and rolls, so she had her, her, her do it. And uh, she, as, like I said, she compiled the recipes, but she also made every one of them to make sure it passed muster. <laughs> so, so when you talk about Minichella's, you're talking about Fausti's. Did she work at Fausti's? No, no, no. no, no. I'm talking about Dario. Dario. Okay. All right, two brothers. Oh, now. we knew, we knew right. Nancy. Nancy mm -hmm. was the uh, the stat keeper for all of her kids' classmates. Mm. She knew where everybody was. Interesting. And. Uh, Let's see, we had, uh, ah, we ate at Potter's. We were eating there when Alan asked me to marry him. And we, uh, <laughs> and we were, and we, we, when we were both, he was, uh, he went to a semester of college and work, was in a couple of plays, that's where I met him. And uh, we went to Fausti's and we went to Fraser's. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had curfew back then, so we had to hurry down after, uh, uh, after a play or a play rehearsal to get down there, have our coffee, and went back to the dorm. And that's because you were a woman? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the dorm, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm reading Norton Bagley's um, book just recently, and I think he made a comment about that. Oh, my grandmother said that when she was going here to the normal school, that, and she was uh, living in that building that later became part of the PEMI, mm -hmm. she told me that the girls would be picked up, were supposed to be picked up by cops and interested people if they saw them even heading across the bridge towards holding a school. I think that's a common set that Norton said as well, too. The girls <laughs> had to be home by seven, yeah. and if not, they would find themselves into a little bit of but trouble. Let's see, where mm. else uh, did we eat? Well, 
my mother, both my mother and my mother-in-law were good cooks. My, there was a Maple Diner down here where the bank is now. Uh, and she, this is Northway Bank for our audience. Oh yes, mm -hmm. Northway. Mm -hmm. And she and her uh, husband worked there a couple of years before they moved it up to... Uh, okay. They met hmm. while she was cooking for a uh, um, Joe Yetton's lumber camp. And that's where, and he had been doing lumbering jobs for quite a while. He was left on his own when he was 13. Mm -hmm. So he was working mm -hmm. in lumber camps and that's how they met. And he did, he did some lumbering, but mostly he cooked. So they both mm -hmm. cooked. Yeah, okay. it was, uh, it was Harry grow, raising uh, eight kids in depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both ran either two or three jobs at a time, plus they had a dance band. Max wow. Mary Makers, you know, wow. and my mom and dad were so glad they missed that part of the states mm -hmm. because even though they weren't rich, it was just the community was such that uh, they would help each other out and they wouldn't run out of things and they had good times together, card games, stuff like that. You That's know? neat. Yeah. When you were growing up, or even today, did you have a best friend? That's the sad part, I think. I think probably the one person I've known the longest was my first uh, roommate in uh, college, whom we kept in touch with each other. But I met, every time we moved, of course, we'd make friends and then we'd move away. Mm -hmm. uh, the one young lady I knew when I was in uh, Baltimore uh, died tragically not long after we moved and another friend wrote me about it and I still I still think about that hmm. because she was such a nice young girl and she was either fifth or sixth grade, you know. Wow. wow. And that's when that's when my thoughts and not everybody is nice came up because hmm. he, she was uh, attacked by a predator, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, then I had uh, Dowlette was a good friend. My, another roommate of mine when I was moving here, when I moved here, and uh, a young lady that ended up being my brother's girlfriend. She was the class <laughs> between us. We were very friendly, and she came up. She and her uh, friend of hers came up, and they uh, got jobs in a resort in Maine. Hmm. And when they could get away, they'd come over to Squam Lake and visit with us, and we'd climb the uh, Squam mountain range and stuff mm. like that, you know. That's neat. Yeah. I'd like to switch gears if I can a little bit because you brought a few artifacts. Uh, it, it shows your skill, your family's skill in, in woodcrafting. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us just a little bit about them? Who made them perhaps? This one here, these two things were Ed Maynard. He was a, had kind of a kinky brain. He could go from building a peeled uh, log chair with a cowhide cushions on it that he had somebody from the D&M so, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. to making a letter opener for his wife in a little tiny uh, thing for his wife for their anniversary. It's two little worms gazing at each other. Mm -hmm which she got a big kick out of. Most people would say, oh. Oh, but, you no, know, it's adorable. She, absolutely he, she adorable. She absolutely loved it. Her, <laughs> his daughter, <laughs> Henrietta, whittled this. Now, she was very skillful with her hands. My father was a uh, uh, covered bridge nut, and he worked uh, with people to restore them a lot while he was working wow. for the bridge maintenance group in Concord. And she made that for him for her, for his birthday one year. And my father did this. He did built furniture too, as I have mentioned before. But he made two of these for my mother, uh, probably just before we were born. So this was made in the 30s. And uh, they could get mahogany down there, which a lot of his stuff was made out of, because they used it for packing. They use it to build crates for packing. Oh. He'd grab those crates and he'd run them through his planer and he built furniture with them that we, we carried from Puerto Rico to uh, Squam Lake. <laughs> you know, you know. 
And this is something that my husband made. We had a bunch of these when we had our business bug monk boxes, and this is a caddy. And you can have them made to the dimensions you wanted and painted with whatever custom design you wanted mm -hmm. to use however you wanted to, which made for something a little better than something at Walmart for your grandpa type mm. thing. And this is a piece I made. Uh, I had a instructor by the name of Patricia Plant, Dr. Plant, taught literature. And I uh, drew a picture of her when I wasn't supposed to be, and I, I had to do a carving for Carl Drerup. So I came up with that. Uh, you should have seen me trying to find a chunk of wood. I went and burrowed through my father's wood pile and my grandfather's until I came by the right uncle wood. Do I ask you what you got for a grade from I, Dr. Drapp? Dr. Drapp. <laughs> I think he gave me a B plus or an A because it's not, you know, it, it's, oh, it's really the finish beautiful. isn't bad because uh, he beautiful. hovered over you on the sanding of things. Mm. Things had to, be, had, had to be just right. That's but it was beautiful. He did not, he was not an easy A person, and that's why I respected him. I mean, uh, <laughs> he wasn't about to uh, fatten up your ego by any means. Your self-esteem was your own problem. <laughs> 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 so. Okay, that was fun. Thank you for taking us back. Oh, I, I need to add one more thing, one more question. You actually do, did, or maybe you still do, paintings on wood? Yeah. So where did that come from? From your relatives or just? My uh, grandfather. I worked with him two summers. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, the first summer he had his shop was on uh, Wentworth Street because the garage was practically hitched to the, the house. And he was, Bill let him use that garage. So that he, that's where he started his sign painting building before he moved down to Railroad Square. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made, we painted some big signs. One was for New Hampshire profiles. And that thing, it was bigger, squared off, bigger than this table. And another one where Teacher's Clam Bar is, there's a school up there now. Uh, they had, uh, before that, somebody was running an ice cream place. Mm. And uh, yeah, they wanted their sign repainted. They didn't like the sign. And my grandfather was not about to go up a ladder. So I did. Mm. And I painted this great big uh, strawberry ice cream cone mm. with all kinds of kibitzing from all over the place. This crazy kid up on a ladder painting this thing. So your grandfather was who? Ed Maynard. Mm -hmm. And he, he taught me all kinds of things. How to paint letters so that I could do lettering. And how you, how you don't do, <laughs> that you do one stroke. Mm -hmm. You can always even it out later, but if you're doing that little picky stuff, you'd be spending forever evening it out. Interesting. Interesting. And he would uh, help me with colors, contrast. He said, a good contrast is better than a bad match. Yeah, <laughs> so. Uh, he, he taught me a lot of things, mm. and you know, he wasn't, uh, and he was funny. He was funny. He, he, he pulled jokes on some of the, the people who had other businesses next to him that I probably shouldn't repeat, so I won't. But anyway, <laughs> he, he would build signs for people. He'd even go out and, and uh, before he was driving, he had, usually had my mother drive him up to uh, Wentworth or Warren, where somebody with an antique shop would want a sign, mm -hmm. and he'd have to. Uh, figure out what they wanted and where it was going to go. So they, it's so fun to see you achieve your gift from your family, your relatives. Oh, my family. My my mother <laughs> was great. artistic, and uh. she but she she downplayed it for a long time. She did a few things. She did some stuff in ceramics, and she did uh, she she made a mug with my grandfather on it. Ed mm. Maynard, his grog is on it. <laughs> ah, that, that sounds neat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, memories of Plymouth, as far as industries, companies that have come, yeah. companies that have gone. Were you excited about hearing some people coming? Yes, I, I, uh, I was glad to see that somebody came in 
to use the Hitchener building, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that the D and M building was going to be used, not torn down and have a gas station or a pizza place with there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, uh, I think the thing that one of the things that really bothered me was the Congregational Church fire, that really bugged us. Uh, in fact, Alan is descended from the first congregational minister. Well, mm. Of course, he's always telling everybody that mm. he fell quite a ways from that tree. But <laughs> it, it just bothered him so much that that some somebody would actually practically torch it. So, uh, and uh, I, I, li I, I was upset when Newberry's left, mm. but I liked Ames's when they came. Yeah. I did all of the decorating in our house on Russell Street with material I got at uh, Newberry's. <laughs> their garment, their clothing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Materials. And they, uh, let's see, some of the things that I uh, like, well, right now I like that they have a, a very nice groomer for my dog down at Railroad Square. <laughs> right? Oh, that's yeah. a, a relatively new? Uh, it's fairly new, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. been, well, oh, she's been around maybe seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. She did work up at the uh, Plymouth Animal Hospital, I think, for a while. But mm -hmm. anyway, they uh, I really uh, enjoyed some of the things that came in, some of the things not so much. Uh, I miss a bookstore, and I miss being able to buy fabric and patterns locally. Locally, yeah. yeah. But And yeah. I'm not against Walmart, but they kind of snuck in under a cloud promised us all this stuff, gave us all this stuff, and now half of the stuff that I enjoyed going up there for is gone. Hmm. They don't have it anymore. So uh, so that's why I miss Ames and Newberries. Hmm. And they had a radio shop down the street, I remember. A guy by the name of Harry Welch ran it in the back of Newberries, hmm. where he would fix things like your uh, uh, record players and your, uh, and your sound systems and things like that. That's right. They were. A lot of people. The inns. I worked at the Pemi Jewasset House for a summer, which is now the Pemi Dorm on uh, campus. Yeah, right. Where they had and, two uh, buildings merged together, mm -hmm. brought one over. Mm -hmm. And we, and then we, and uh, of course I worked. There was a business called uh, Moose Mountain. A guy by the name of Matt Whittall ran, and he was a, a very interesting character. He was descended from the people who. Uh, built some kind of, uh, not Chris Craft, but a similar type of high-end uh, boat, and also a carpet company. He was, wow. but he was on his own doing that, and, he, and the woman he married was a designer who did uh, window designs and stuff like that for big Hollywood, for big Chicago stores. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, he, was a, he was kind of a mentor, in a way because he uh, took an interest in the town. He took an interest in the town where he was living, which was, uh, there's a building up there called the Wentworth Inn and Get Gallery. That's where they lived. And they would get artists in and stuff. Hmm. They had a artist they were supporting from Jamaica that did some pretty fine work. And then they had era? music stuff. What this era? would be in the, I'm trying to think when I worked there. Uh, 70s. 70s. Yeah. Town was starting to explode at that time. Yeah. I think our time is slowly coming to a close, but I have one more question I'd like to ask, and then you can add if you would like to. If you had a group of uh, young students in front of us right now, young townsfolks here, is there some words of wisdom, some advice, uh, some just in information that you would like to share with them from a person who's been around several decades? Is that fair? Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> it, um, mm. Yes, because most of the advice I got were from older people and relatives. Yeah. I think my grandfather's thing was to uh, be true to yourself and, and, and don't uh, obliterate any options you might have when you're young. There's mm. too many young people do that. They end up with not so many options options as to what they're going to do in the future because they've already messed them up. Don't do that. Don't uh, treat everybody fairly. 
with kindness and be uh, be aware of their situations when when you're with them so that you don't uh, step on too many people inadvertently mm -hmm. because I see that a lot you know. mm -hmm. if you if you're in any way judgmental sometimes you haven't walked in their moccasins and maybe you should kind of bite your tongue mm -hmm. <laughs> right good, good advice good advice for us to finish off with I want to I want to thank you for your willingness to come in and, and share some of your stories, your memories of the town of Plymouth. Oftentimes we're moving at such a fast pace, we forget what a community is. And that means getting together, mm -hmm. um, having a chance to think about older times, how important it was, what we learned from our mother and father. Uh, and if you have so often shared with me pictures, Mm -hmm. So I say to the audience again, you and I over time really have gone back and forth. Thank you, thank you, thank you many times for all the pictures whenever I've requested them from you for some of the projects I've been working on. So keep taking your pictures. Most importantly, what are we going to do? What have I been saying each time I'm on? If there's a story that goes along with the picture, please consider writing something about it on the back and then future generations will thank us for it yeah. for later. So. Thanks again one more time for tuning in to the Memories of Plymouth. I am just absolutely delighted to have this opportunity. It was fun. Yeah, I, I thought I knew fun. you, and I now know you even a little bit better. Thank you, <laughs> Evelyn. I appreciate it. It was You're great.